it's okay to be angry sometimes, but to be angry in the right way, at the right time, in the right place, for the right thing, that's what we have to aim for. You're listening to Damn the Absolute, a podcast about our relationship to ideas. Produced by Eradicus. Here's your host, Jeffrey Howard. Welcome, friends, philosophers, and fellow practitioners of ideas. This is episode 18 of Damn the Absolute. A philosophy of living, similar to a religion, explains the human condition and provides a moral and spiritual guide for how we can navigate identified challenges. It directs our behavior and helps us understand the significance of what we experience. Originating in the ancient Greco-Roman world, Stoicism is a life philosophy that places reason at the center of human flourishing. For a Stoic, living well means developing one's moral character through logic and mindfulness. Virtue is the highest good. And by focusing on what we can control and accepting what we can't, A Stoic tackles the world with equanimity. Derek Parsons is an educator with a bachelor's degree in English and history and a master's in educational administration. He serves as a contributing editor for Eradicus and co-hosts the Open Door Philosophy Podcast. In this episode, he introduces us to ancient Stoics such as Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, explains the recent resurgence of Stoicism, and reflects on the benefits this 2,300-year-old philosophy has for us moderns. A few questions on Stoic thought. Why are we wrong to view the Stoic as detached and emotionally muted? Does Stoicism allow for a variety of religious views, including a belief in God? What are the potential pitfalls of focusing too much on developing one's moral character? And which philosophies of living couple well with Stoicism? I hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Derek, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's good to be here. This will be a familiar question to you, Derek. What is a viewpoint you've held in adulthood you were certain wouldn't change that's actually shifted dramatically for you? Well, there's, there seems like there's so many, of course. But I think the one I, I want to mention is, is God. That I understood who God was. I guess like many teenagers, we're... We're searching for a a type of identity, a certainty in identity. And and what could be more certain than identity in God, especially for a kid who grew up in in Protestant Christianity? But in order to do that, I thought I had to to pin God down to box and label so that I could know who God was and and what he was for and and what he was against. And these sort of black and white lines of demarcation on, on all manner of issues and ideas But all these years later, it seems so foolish to claim to know the mind of God. So there's a lot more there, obviously, but that's certainly that's certainly one of the one of the big ones in my life. Where do you find yourself in regards to your views of God now? Do you consider yourself a religious person still? Maybe someone who's generally interested in questions of religion? Oh, I'm very interested in religion. One of the reasons I really gravitated towards philosophy is is questions related to religions I, I get, to answer your question though i guess these days i lean more towards what i would call a sort of a, a mystery conception of god that that the many things i was sure god represented those decades ago are, are, are just manifestations maybe of a of a higher reality that cannot be understood or named that god is is a label that we've applied to god i i think of i think of the theologian uh, paul tillich who calls god that the God above God. That's the real God. As if the, the label God restricts or limits us. Or if to go in an Eastern route, you know, that I think of the opening two lines of the Tao Te Ching, where it says, uh, the, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. If I substitute God for Tao, that really kind of embodies a lot of what I'm trying to say. But, but on the other hand, I also don't want my conception or relationship with God to be entirely abstract. I do want there to be some concreteness there, but also to allow room for, well, it sounds funny, but for God to be God, um, <laughs> not have me try to uh, to define that too much. 
And I guess maybe if you want to talk about biblical sources, if I lean towards anyone, it's probably more towards the Apostle John, who's the most mystic of the apostles, and certainly is the doctrine of love speaks most to me. It's interesting that you bring up a lot of mysticism and the ineffability of God and mystery and your religious or philosophical journey when there's a, another major philosophical tradition to draw from, and that is Stoicism, that tends to be, I would say, maybe a little bit allergic to, to mystery or mysticism or not as drawn to it. And we're going to be talking about Stoicism today. Stoicism has been around for over 2,000 years, and we've seen a bit of a recent resurgence. What, is, what are we to make of this resurgence? Yeah, Stoicism has kind of taken off, I guess. Uh, I, I have a number of reasons, uh, and I think they're all, I don't know if they're equally legitimate, but I, I think the first one is there's currently a market for it. Money talks, and if you look in the <laughs> publishing world, there's just been uh, an uptick of books and, and other materials on Stoicism. And being that there is a, a ready-made group of people, philosophers, who are well-versed in that, ready to go, they can write their books and they can package it and off they go. And I think it's an easy sell. You have lots of podcasts these days, um, the Daily Stoic with Ryan Holiday, Stoic Meditations with uh, Massimo Piglucci. There's something called Stoicon that's been going on for the last four years. Uh, last year, they had to go Everybody's virtual. Everybody's got to have their conference. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, they went virtual last year. So, so Stoicon 2020 is on YouTube if, if you're looking for resources. There's a new translation of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations that has just come out. There's a book that's just come out called Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living In by Kai Whitling and Leonidas Constantikos in 2021. So I think it's very marketable as a sort of self-help because that's always very popular in the, and there's always trends that come and go with that in the publishing world. So right now it's, it's being used a little bit self-help-ish. But outside of that, I think one of the attractive things about Stoicism is that it's very egalitarian. We are all equal before virtue, and I don't want to put the cart before the horse here, but, but virtue is an important part of, of Stoicism. And so we're, we're all equal before that, no matter what walk of life we are, no matter where we are born, no matter what ethnicity we are, we, we're all equal before, before virtue. Anyone can seek to live a virtuous life. But also, Stoicism has kind of always been with us. Like you mentioned, it's, it's, uh, it's about 2,300 years old. It passes the test of time qualification, right? If it's been around this long, then maybe there's something to it. So perhaps that appeals to people. And, and it does have, if you will, good bones. Some of the originators or, or where ideas were taken from, you have certainly when it comes to virtue and rationalism, names like Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, and, and people know those. And then if you know Rome well enough, you also have some big hitters there that are Stoics like uh, Cato and Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. So I think that might attract people because those are well-known people that have good street cred, if you will. Well, well I guess one last thing. If we identify the, an American ethic as being hardworking, that's one of our American ethics. There is an aspect of tough-mindedness in Stoicism, and perhaps that appeals a bit to us here, at least in the United States and, and other associated areas. You listed off a lot of people and I understand most people who practice stoicism tend to have a favorite stoic. Who is the stoic that you resonate the most with? Yeah, that is, it is kind of funny how that works out. So there are three main sources for stoicism, at least from Rome. There are other stoics, but the three big one are uh, Seneca, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, and they were all lived within about 150 years of each other in the first and second century CE. For me, my favorite is Marcus Aurelius. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I like them all. I've read them all. They're all great, but they're very different, of course. Seneca is a senator and a, an, a, an aristocrat. And all of his... He, Seneca comes to us through, through letters, letters that he wrote to uh, his good friends, and his writing style is, is very formal, uh, as it was for the time when he wrote. And he has lots of good things to say, but it's through letters. Then you have Epictetus, who was a slave. So very different experience than being an aristocrat. He was a slave and eventually was freed from that and became a Stoic teacher. Epictetus comes to us through 
lectures that his students wrote down. Epictetus never wrote anything down, but his students did. So his is a very sort of relaxed feel. It's a lecture type feel to his works. The reason I, I really gravitate towards Marcus Aurelius is his particular writing style. Marcus comes to us through journal writing. His practice was that every day before he, and this is mostly in the last 10 years of his life, but every day before he began the day, he would journal about what he was going to face that day. And his journals are, were, were never written for really anyone else to see. They were strictly for him. And that does get us a little bit into the realm of what Stoic practice might look like. But, but he wrote these, these journal entries for himself to help to be introspective and help deal with uh, some of the perplexing and, and moral difficulties he, would, he might be facing that day. And so when you read his book, which is called Meditations, it's very personal and it's very engaging because when he's writing, he's writing to himself but he feels like he's writing to you. It's like you're having a conversation with a friend about a lot of just very difficult, perplexing questions. And I guess the other thing that, uh, that attracts me to Marcus is that he was, he was literally the most powerful man in the world, unless you want to consider the Han emperor over in China. He's the emperor of Rome. He has vast amounts of wealth and power and militaries and all of that. And he could have, as we've seen with many of the Roman emperors, he could have been corrupt. He could have abused that power. And no person is perfect. In fact, Marcus notes that of himself. But it seems like through these many, many journal entries that he works very hard to be level-headed, to be introspective and virtuous. He knows he's not perfect, but he also knows that he is a constant work in progress. So we have a few figures we can look at. What is the foundation of Stoicism? What are some of its central tenets? Yeah, so I'm sure we'll get into this in greater depth later in the episode, but there's two main basic foundational ideas. One is to follow the four cardinal virtues, which are courage, wisdom, justice, and temperance, and to be mindful of those at all times. The second core tenet would be be to, to also be mindful of what you can and cannot control. It's what they call the dichotomy of control. So those are the two big ones. There's a number of other things. There's a great deal of emphasis on reason and using your human reason to, to of course, employ uh, or deploy the, the cardinal virtues to navigate our morally difficult situations that come up in our everyday life, but also just the regular everyday occurrences that we, that we have that are not large, moral, difficult situations. There's also a, a deep, a real deep river that runs through it that deals with the idea of cosmopolitanism, which again, I think we'll get to later. But those are some of the, those are some of the big ones. Stoicism is understood as a philosophy of living. Why is it a philosophy of living rather than maybe a religion? So a philosophy of, of living deals with some questions that other branches of philosophy don't necessarily deal with, I suppose. You know, maybe like philosophy of consciousness or philosophy of religion. Of course, a lot of things in philosophy are inter interwoven with each other. But philosophy of, of living deals specifically with how to live best, right? And in, in, in each philosophy of living, we have two aspects. We have a metaphysics that explains how the world is. In other words, it identifies the condition. And then there's always an ethical side of it. In other words, how do we act or how should we best act given that we understand what the condition is? So with Stoicism, it, it certainly does all those things. It discusses why human reason is the greatest faculty we have and why it should, should guide us. It ha does have a, an underlying principle uh, and a belief in a deity. Of course, in the case of the Romans and the Greeks, that was Zeus. But certainly it's compatible with, with any any theistic or theistic ideal. But Stoicism doesn't identify a specific God. It, it, it worships no God, though the ancients were religious. They did not view God as having really an impact on the world as or being terribly involved in the world. Uh, this was due mostly to the, to the Roman state religion, which really wasn't a, a terribly personal religion. 
at least at the time when these Roman Stoics were writing, and, and, and therefore their God wasn't that terribly personal as, as well. They did believe that the reasoning part of ourself was a spark of the divine, a, a bit of divinity in all of us. And that goes all the way back to Plato and Socrates, that idea. So it's that this reason allows us to have right conduct to make the right choices with our reasoning part, which overrides our, our appetitive and, and spirited aspects of our humanity. But none of that necessarily has to involve a god in their conception. I would understand that Stoicism probably allows room for certain conceptions of God or the divine more so than others. As you mentioned, a more fundamentalist view of God as an active participant in my personal life is probably a religious view that is a little less amenable to a lot of the Stoics. Would the I'm just wondering how much space do the Stoics actually allow for a plurality of religious viewpoints? Well, that, that's an interesting question. All throughout the Stoics, you have reference to God. Again, they're referencing Zeus. But the way that I view Stoicism and how I read it is that it's amenable to really any religion because, because all religions advocate for good moral behavior. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about virtues. Acting virtuous towards yourself and towards others is in, in many ways what a lot of religions call for in terms of behavior, if you will, for lack of a better term. So I see Stoicism as, as an open platform, if you will. <laughs> for the Stoics, there are three primary disciplines, and those are ethics, physics, which includes metaphysics for the Stoics, and logic. And you've already talked a little bit about some of the metaphysics for Stoics. I want to touch on just a couple of the metaphysical struggles or tensions or wrestles, I guess, through the centuries. Are Stoics determinists? This is a really, uh, this is a really fun question. M my answer to that is no. I would call them compatibilists. Which, which, if you're unfamiliar with that term, is it's it's kind of the middle road between libertarian free will and and hard determinism. So the Stoics have a, a great emphasis on the nature of things and acknowledging what the nature of things are. Now, of course, the Greeks and, and the Romans scientifically were not as as well informed as we are today. However, with the knowledge that they had and understanding what the nature of things are, I think it serves serves the philosophy well enough. So let's take, for example, like maybe just simply like a ball and an incline, right? The, the nature of a ball is that it's spherical, it's round, and it's going to roll very easily. And if you put that ball on an incline, the nature is that it will roll down because of gravity, because of the incline, because of the ball itself. There's nothing you can do. Well, there's nothing that nature can do to stop that. So that's the nature of things, and it's determined that the ball would do that. You, however, are the change agent, right? Now, we as human beings, we have a certain nature as well, and, and we can talk about that, at least the stoic conception of our human nature. But where we get away from determinism is that we can stop the ball, or we can push the ball back up the incline, or we can just throw it in the wastebasket or whatever. We can act upon that thing. So, so to take this ball and incline example and make it a little more real world, let, let's talk about the, the reactions that we have, the, the impulses that we have when things occur in our life, whether that's, whether that's anger, sometimes we are quick to anger, sometimes we're slow to it, whether we're talking about lust, which the Stoics talk an awful lot about. We might have these thoughts where we are angry and we want to take revenge on a person, or we are having feelings of lust and we want to have relations with that person. That is a thought. We are, that is within our nature as the Stoics saw it, but we are in control of what we do. And that's where virtue comes in. And, and that's where I think they, we move away from hard determinism into the realm of compatibilism. It does put the choice in the hands of the person who, who is in control. In fact, a quote from Marcus Aurelius related to this says, if all the rest is common coin, then what is unique to the good man? To welcome with affection what is sent by fate, 
not to stain or disturb the spirit within him with a mess of false beliefs, instead to preserve it faithfully by calmly obeying God, saying nothing untrue, doing nothing unjust. So these things can happen to us, but in the end, we have the choice of saying nothing untrue, doing nothing unjust. As I'm understanding Stoicism, there's a strong thread of essentialism that runs through it, whether that's us as human beings, we have a human nature that's pretty universal across a lot of cultures and times, or even to the point of living according to nature is so important for a Stoic that Stoics can discern the nature of reality, which helps them to know what they can control and what they cannot control. So is it fair to say that, safe to say that Stoics have this view that there is an inherent nature to reality? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it's terribly complex, though. So what they would identify as human nature, well, specifically human nature, would be our ability to reason. So if you go all the way back to like the Socratic or Platonic model of, of a human being, the things that we share with the animal world are our appetites, our urges, right, our animalistic urges. And then we also share emotions like fear and anger and jealousy and things like that. But the thing that sets us apart is our ability to reason. And that is what is uniquely human in the eyes of a Stoic. And even still today, Stoics, modern Stoics would do not see that in conflict with any sort of modern scientific understanding. Although we today know that certain animal species are far more intelligent than the Greeks and Romans would have, have conceived of them. But still, they would see that our ability to reason and in the, in the mind of like the ancient Stoics, that's, the, that's that spark of divinity. That is the thing that separates us from every single other thing. And therefore, it is the thing that elevates us. And so we can choose to use that reason or not use that reason, but that reason is available to us. And that is, that is our nature. What are the limits of reason for a Stoic, or in your own view, do you feel like there are points in which Stoics maybe fetishize reason? Yeah, I think there's a, a limit to reason. It is a very powerful faculty that we have, without question. But it does. Th there is an, a place where reason ends, and a lot of philosophers talk about this, right? Where we talk about moving into the realm of, I guess, maybe what we might call metaphysics. Of course. Uh, Kierkegaard would have called it the leap, right? Yeah, you, you have to take that leap of faith where reason ends. Reason can only take you so far. But also, you know, deterministically speaking, for some people, reasoning is, is a very difficult thing, depending on what sort of mental state we're in. I, I don't think stoicism, at least its emphasis on reason, I don't know that it does so well in terms of taking into account of, of say, mental illness, severe mental illness. It seems to me anyway that, that oftentimes we're not in control of our thoughts. Just toying around with, with, uh, with meditation will we'll show a person this, that, that we are prone to have ugly thoughts. We're prone to lose our temper, et cetera, inside of our head, just as, just as much as we are to have good thoughts. But a Stoke would say this is the work of, of strengthening, strengthening the mind. And, and it's important to remember that, that thoughts are not actions. But still, I do think if someone is, is in, say, severe depression, it's, it's going to be much more difficult for them to appeal to their reason to make moral decisions that are, or decisions that are good for them. You bring up mental health or mental illness. How much of a quote-unquote cure is stoic thought for mental illness, anxiety, depression, or might it be better viewed as a supplement or something alternative, maybe an intervention? Well, I think today it's certainly sold as, as a very powerful means to, to help overcome difficulties. I, I think today it's certainly packaged as something that can be a, a very powerful antidote to depression. I know that there's a lot of articles out there that people have written that reading Marcus Aurelius' meditations has turned their life around. And that's fantastic for those people. So based on the evidence that I've seen, I, I guess the answer to that is yes. I can, however, from personal experience, know that I think some of the things that the Stoics ask of us in terms of Stoic practice would be, I think, incredibly difficult to use if you're in 
a, a severe depression. But I also know that getting out of severe depression is not easy work and neither is stoicism. Hello friends, Jeffrey here. Please go ahead, take a quick moment to click that subscribe button and rate us. It really helps us to further grow the community around Damn the Absolute. Enjoy the rest of the episode. If I'm a Stoic, virtue is incredibly important to me. How am I to understand virtue and ethics as a Stoic? So let's go back to the four cardinal virtues, right? Wisdom, uh, courage, wisdom, justice, and temperance. From each of these virtues flows so many other good works. We're very familiar with the idea of virtues, I think. We, we have these colloquial sayings, these idioms, you know, uh, patience is a virtue, things like this. Uh, we might identify things like generosity and humility as, as virtues as well. But those all seem to be subcategories of these higher virtues. These virtues have been around and, and were introduced really with Aristotle. And then as Zeno, who was the, uh, the founder of, of Stoicism, found himself in Athens, picked up on this idea after a tragedy in his life and picked up on, on Aristotle's teaching of these virtues, he brought them forward into, into Stoicism. And then by extension, we see these virtues continue throughout the European Middle Ages with our theistic philosophers, such as St. Thomas Aquinas, still find that these four Stoic virtues are very beneficial and practical. So perhaps that's their contribution to it. For me, they seem to stand the test of time there are many virtues you can go through. Actually, you can look at some of our uh, founding fathers of the United States. Benjamin Franklin kept a virtue journal. Thomas Jefferson identified 10 virtues. Washington certainly looked to the Stoics, as, as especially Aurelius, as great inspiration for especially virtues like courage. So there are, there are, there are many, many virtues, but these seem to, like I say, stand the test of time. So if you think about courage, well, what exactly do we mean by that in terms of virtue? Courage, I think in this way, is acting morally right in the right situations. To have courage to stand up and stand for the, for the things that are morally right, that is courageous action. Wisdom, and a lot of, a lot of Stoics will call this practical wisdom. It's just being able to know in those morally difficult decisions what is right and what is wrong. And perhaps the greatest wisdom is knowing that there really is no right or wrong in that, and you just must move forward anyway. So you have wisdom, justice. I think today in our society, when you think of justice, we probably think of the justice system in the United States. In other words, justice is something that is applied after a, an action has occurred that has wronged someone, we demand justice. But justice in the Stoic conception, the virtue conception, is how we treat others. Do we treat others with fairness? Do we treat others with generosity? This is justice. And then we have, of course, temperance, which is just simply self-control, right? Neither extreme, neither to excess, nor to you know, deficiency. We are in control of ourselves, in self-control, and the things that we do, the way we act, and we behave. There are a lot of ethical considerations to, to account for as a human. Some of them are competing. It could be obligations or a sense of duty to my family, to my friends, to people in my community, people in other countries. An effective altruist may focus on even further away from my family or my household than that. How does a Stoic approach these competing obligations in trying to live an ethical or virtuous life? Do I have a, a greater duty to any of these groups? A greater duty to the virtues? A greater obligation to the individuals. Is there, am I first and foremost a citizen of the world? Should I be, as I mentioned, if I'm an effective altruist, should I be focusing on where I can be the most beneficial in giving of my charity, which may be someone in the far reaches of Central Africa versus my child or my neighbor? How do I approach these questions? A Stoic acknowledges that there is never a concrete answer to anything. 
except for following the, the virtues and, and attempting to understand what you can control and cannot control. So there is no pat answer to, to that question, say, if we're to reference Peter Singer and that we should be an effective altruist and give money to children in, in Africa. What a Stoic would, would do first, and this is the prime focus, and sometimes what they take a hit for, actually, is an emphasis on the self, on the individual being a good practitioner of virtue. The idea here is not, however, that the individual is more important than others. The idea is that if the Stoic focuses on the, the indiv- on themselves, that then by effect, if they follow the four Stoic virtues and employ them the way that they are intended to be employed, then the goodness, if you will, or the ethic or the moral good decision will then go out from the Stoic and into the community. So kind of a good example of like, if you will, walk in the faith instead of preach in the faith. Um, <laughs> I think it was, uh, was St. Francis that said, spread the gospel wherever you go, use words if you have to. So the Stoic embodies the virtues and by constantly working on, on the inner self, we Stoics better others and themselves around them. So there is certainly a conception of doing good for your family and then your extended family and your community, then your city and state. And then there's a a big emphasis on cosmopolitanism. I think it was Socrates that said, I am not an Athenian nor a Greek, but I am a citizen of the world. And again, Socrates had a huge influence on the development of Stoicism. And Marcus Aurelius speaks about this all the time, the importance of being aware that he is a member of the human race. So, so yes, by extension, you even get this very broad vision of humanity, being a part of humanity. I want to extend this a little bit into the political realm. For a Stoic, acceptance of the nature of reality and maybe even nature of society is important. And the dichotomy of change is about knowing what you can and cannot change. How might a Stoic determine when is it right or when is the right time to change something about society and when is there an aspect of society that either can't be changed or shouldn't be changed? I don't know that there's a way to determine when that point is. Like I said earlier, you Stoics, Stoics live their way through the issues of the day. But when that time comes, they're certainly called to be courageous. They're certainly called to attempt to influence whatever the issue might be that virtue leads them to the the way that they should attempt to influence that situation. It is interesting that Stoicism sometimes, or Stoics sometimes get this sort of reputation as being detached and uninvolved with civilization and certainly uninvolved with their emotions and and really just trying to find the sort of equanimity, right? This sort of tranquility and, and peace of mind. Some people feel that that's in contrast to being like involved in the political arena. But when you look at the Stoics who were Roman, they were almost exclusively politicians. They were very much so involved in shaping the world and shaping their societies. A lot of your Stoics write during some of the most tumultuous history in Rome's existence, where you have the civil wars that come after uh, starts with an S. Can't get Seneca out of my head. Sola. So some of the most contentious times in Roman history where you have civil wars involving Sola. And then after that, you have Julius Caesar who becomes the dictator. And then Julius Caesar is assassinated. And you have the triumvirate and we have civil war. And it, this is when most of your, most of your Stoics were writing. So they're certainly involved. They're always, not always, many of the ones who survive. And of course, they're aristocrats. And so that's likely why their writings and thoughts survived. But many of them are, are very, very involved, very involved. In fact, if you take Marcus Aurelius, when he writes his meditations, most of those writings were done while he was on campaign in Germania at war. So Stoics are not uh, aloof and detached. They are called, actually, to be involved. Speaking to this maybe stereotype or caricature of Stoics as detached, part of that goes hand in hand with this notion of the Stoic figure who has their emotions are muted, they're serious, they're not really phased by anything. Could you say a bit more about what that stereotype gets wrong about the emotional life of a Stoic? So emotions are part of, of all of us. And just like with the virtues, there's 
good emotions, and then there's harmful emotions. And we should look towards and try to accentuate the good emotions as much as we can and try to alleviate ourselves from the negative emotions. So the idea that a stoic is this person standing on the mountaintop with the wind whipping around them and they are completely unfazed by anything. I really think that's a a misrepresentation. The Stoics don't really advocate for this. What they do advocate for is is understanding the situation and the conditions and what's in your control and what is not. And this does not mean that you are not sad. This doesn't mean that you're not angry sometimes. These, however, are negative emotions. You'll feel them, and that's fine to feel them, but we don't want to wallow in them. We don't want them to consume us, right, to the point where we become just very unhappy people. So absolutely relish in the good times. Enjoy that, uh, that peace and happiness and tranquility and, and strive for that. But when those negative emotions arise, when we have jealousy, envy, something like that, then we need to acknowledge them, bring them out to the light of day, say this is what's happening, and as best we can suppress that because, again, we don't want that to evolve into something much more self-destructive. As I'm hearing you, Derek, Stoics want to acknowledge or minimize negative emotions, encourage and nurture the more positive ones. Is there a room for a Stoic to give in to ecstasy, just letting their enthusiasm, for lack of a better term, run wild? Think of the, the unmitigated joy that can happen at a concert or in a dance hall or a whole host of activities. Are Stoics going to say, yes, give in to the revelry? Or is a Stoic going to say, you can appreciate to a certain degree, but you need to pull back the reins just a little bit. You need to moderate that enthusiasm. (laughs) Well, I think the technical answer is to moderate that enthusiasm. But I don't think really there's anything wrong with giving into that. So long as just like with negative emotions, these positive emotions, we also don't want to lose ourselves in that as well. I kind of, I kind of think of it in terms of like Aristotle's golden mean. He, he, he says that, that, that the golden mean of, of any of these virtues or vices, well, any of these virtues is that we find the sweet spot, if you will. You know, if you talk about courage and the golden mean, if you have too much courage, well, then you're the crazy guy on the battlefield running out into the, into the, uh, to the field of battle without no one following you. And it's rashness, right? But the opposite end of, of courage is that you're not doing anything at all and you're a coward. You got to find that, that sweet spot of, of courage. And, and I think, you know, if we're going to go to a concert and just revel in it, which of course I love, uh, <laughs> then, uh, then I think absolutely dive into that, but don't stay there because Aristotle says with anger, it's okay to be angry sometimes, but to be angry in the right way, at the right time, in the right place, for the right thing, that's what we have to aim for. So if that concert is, and that euphoria that you get from it is is the right euphoria for the right reasons, for the right time, for the right meaning, all of that, I think it's permissible. What do you personally find lacking in Stoicism? What makes it perhaps an incomplete philosophy of living. So some of it is actually kind of what we've been talking about. I've spent a lot of time studying different philosophies of living. And and right before I took a a deep dive into Stoicism these last couple of years, I I was reading pretty heavily in in existentialism. And of course, in existentialism, we want to fill everything. (laughs) And it's a, it's, there's a great emphasis on passion. And to be in the world is to profoundly feel the world. And I was almost hesitant to really start trying to get into Stoicism because I felt like, like well, I, I guess maybe I did sort of had the, the stereotypical view of Stoics that we got to minimize all that. In fact, we can't even have all of that. But I don't know if that's necessarily a knock against Stoicism from my personal perspective. From all the involvement I've had with it the last couple of years, I see I see the nuance, if you will, of the philosophy and where it makes room for passion and emotions. I think maybe perhaps some of the other things that, that it does take a hit for, again, is, is issues with, with mental health and the emphasis on the power of reason. We all know that the, that the Greeks just had this tremendous faith in the power of reason. And like I said earlier, it's a powerful faculty, but it has its limits. To put it differently, Derek, what are some philosophies 
adjacent to stoicism that you find helpful in shoring up some of those deficiencies? You're already speaking a little bit more to existentialism. Do you think it works in helping to bring together those two philosophies? Are there other philosophies that you think are really beneficial to bring in with stoicism? There's a couple, and and I don't know that I necessarily identify as as a Stoic. I, I pull from so many different traditions, wisdom traditions, but I do think that there is some that certainly can enhance Stoicism. What well, one is Taoism, and yeah, sometimes I tell my students that Stoicism is the most Eastern of the Western philosophies, and I think some of it has to do with with ideas built into to Taoism, which is sort of this emphasis on letting go of the ego. Marcus Aurelius talks a great deal about issues of fame or wanting to be well known. If you place that into our modern context with social media and wanting to become a TikTok influencer or whatever the next greatest thing is, we all crave sort of this fame. That comes from ego, or at least the ne- negative aspects of ego. And so while Stoicism through the virtues sort of asks you to let go of that ego, Taoism takes a bit of a different approach in terms of, of letting go of the ego, but they do both incorporate a, a, the idea that an unhealthy ego can lead us astray. I also think, and you mentioned existentialism a second ago, I, I think the existential emphasis on the idea of authenticity can be very, be very empowering with attempting to embody the virtues. I know that you might say like, well, how can we be authentic if we're following four cardinal virtues? But oftentimes, <laughs> at least I find in my experience, that following those four cardinal virtues are quite difficult. And to attempt to embody them, I do sort of bring myself into being with, I think, a degree of authenticity. And then also the idea, you know, if, we, if we're to take pragmatism, the ideas of, of building and moving forward with the stoic idea that we should be involved in society, I think pragmatism can, can help inform stoicism in that way. And for anyone who is wanting to venture further down the path with Stoicism, what are some practices, concrete things people can start with? I think the easiest thing to start with is also probably the most common thing and most useful thing. It's very simple, and that's to journal, to be introspective with the way that you have conducted yourself during the day. Maybe this could also fall under some negative aspects of of stoicism stoicism stoics do have to be rather critical of themselves and self forgiveness really needs to be a, a big part of that as well but with journaling marcus aurelius every morning like i said he, he, before he started the day he would journal and and prepare himself what is ready to encounter seneca on the other hand would actually journal at the end of the day and, and reflect on how well they conducted themselves how well they embodied the virtues. You can even take Benjamin Franklin, for example, though. He carried around in his pocket a virtue tracker, uh, a little checklist where he would check off how well he did with his virtues that day. So through journaling, you're able to be critical. And I would say, if you're starting out with this, take one of the virtues, right? And spend the week just paying mind to that one particular virtue. And that way, you don't have to worry about all of the virtues and dichotomy of control and all these things. You just focus on that virtue. How have you conducted yourself? How have you been just to to people that week? And when people are not just to you, how have you reacted to that? And through this sort of introspection, the idea is that slowly over time, you begin to train the mind where you're able to, when you're out in society and doing the things you do, that you're able to have that right conduct comes to you easier than it would be overall. And so with the self-critical aspect, like I said earlier with Marcus Aurelius, he realized that he was a project in process, or it, he, was, he was always in process to becoming a, as virtuous a person as he could. And so with being self-critical, it is important to be self-forgiving as well. And so Marcus says in, in 5.9, not to feel exasperated or defeated or despondent because your days aren't packed with wise and moral actions, but to get back up when you fail, to celebrate behaving like a human, however imperfectly, and fully embrace the pursuit that you've embarked on. It seems that for Stoics with this focus on virtue and developing moral character and becoming better each day that a Stoic can be so 
focused on themselves and become so focused on trying to be better and better and better and better to the point that a stoic can end up or someone attempting to practice stoicism maybe more accurate can end up blinding themselves to the people around them because they're so focused on trying to improve the self what advice or counsel do you have for someone to avoid that pitfall yeah so kind of contradictory earlier when i said the stoics and and taoist tried to move away from ego attempting to improve yourself in a way is ego <laughs> so I, I think the advice is the the things that you're attempting to improve about yourself are always in context we are always in context with others in this world with others that are around us and so the types of virtues that you may be concerning yourself with will be virtues that concern other people if you're talking about being courageous with someone maybe you need to have a tough conversation with your friend and that's how you need to be courageous maybe with justice you spoke about someone to someone else in a way that you should not have and and you're very unfair to them i think every virtue that you focus on has to do with other people so maybe that's maybe that's the answer well derek thank you for coming on the show and giving us a stroll through ancient rome and hopefully we can adopt some of these practices in our lives yeah absolutely thanks for having me thank you for listening to damn the absolute i hope you found our conversation worthwhile we would love it if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts whether that is stitcher itunes Castbox, or one of the many other options available to you it goes a long way in helping us to build a community committed to fruitful ideas see you next time